So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about future therapeutic interventions in autoimmune hepatitis. And uh, this is probably one of the topics I get the most questions on. I'm going to be a, have a disclosure is I have little to no experience with any of these compounds. So kind of a weird talk to give. Um, but again, we have to be forward thinking. So we're going to look at the limitations of the current AIH treatment model. Uh, some of that will be redundant. Future overall or global AIH treatment goals. Review the immunologic nature of AIH. And, and this is, uh, we've gotten hit on a number of points of what immune pieces have been involved in this disease. I'm going to try to summarize it in one roadmap for you to you kind of understand and maybe use in the future to help understand where the targets could be that we could use to treat. Then think about biologically plausible agents, linking trials but also off-label indications for medications. I posted this on social media <clears throat> this past week. And does anybody have an answer? What, what does this guy have to do with the current paradigm? Yeah, so uh, this missed my generation. This is Blondie or the man with no name. Yes, and in fact, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think this is probably a good way to frame this. And uh, hopefully I can paint a picture. There is some good, okay, so all hope is not lost. Because we know first-line therapy has really improved clinical laboratory and histologic manifestations in a lot of patients. This is fantastic. Also, transplant-free survivals, as Dr. Gallery said, 90% and 70% respectively at 10 and 20 years. So this is great news. Unfortunately, this may have been one of the stumbling blocks for the development of new therapies, because people do so well with this. However, the bad. Liver tests improve, or partial response, but fail to normalize in about 15% of patients. We think that that may progress fibrosis, as we've talked about. And they also worsen during therapy and a treatment failure in about 7 to 10% of patients. We also know medication dose change of, because of termination, or I'm sorry, because of termination because of side effects. Those two things come around in about 10 to 15% of patients. So not everybody tolerates these therapies. Now what is the ugly? We must be real with ourselves. We know fibrosis scores increase in approximately 25% of patients. I can tell you, Indiana, we looked at this data. It turns out to be about 10 to 20% of patients, despite, quote unquote, our best efforts. Now, these best efforts have been employed over the past 20 years, at least, of what data we've been collecting. Hopefully, in 20 years, we'll say that Craig Lambert and the rest of hepatologists at IU have done a better job. But it does highlight a really important piece. We must reframe this whole goal, it's fibrosis regression, not progression. Cirrhosis development in up to 40%. That is a huge number. This is taken from one study. Longitudinally, we see patients that present without cirrhosis. By the end of uh, 20 to 25 years, we see progression so much that patients do have advanced disease. So this is staggering, honestly. And then relapse off therapy. You've seen this number often today, up to 90%, depending on the study. The current paradigm Marilyn Monroe painted. This is a very poor resolution photo. And this is how I envision our current approach to AIH. We are using agents that really hit we don't know what. We are turning down immunologic activation. We have tried other agents, such as Prograf, Sirolimus, Cyclosporin, in attempts to rescue poor responders. However, even those agents have been marred with the problem of poor response side effects and other bad outcomes. However, this is where we want to go. We want to go high resolution. We want to go targeted, individualized, phenotypic direction to really hit the patient where they need it. And again, this is the goal of individualized therapy. So high resolution therapy is hopefully the wave of the future. Goals for therapy, we've talked about this, but more of a global perception. We want to restore your body's ability to not hate your liver. Restore self-tolerance to autoantigens. That means pieces of your, of your body and or liver that are triggering this immune activation. We want to minimize the side effects of the medications that we give you. Again, I showed a slide yesterday. Um, be scared of your doctors. And again, how to protect yourself from your doctor hurting you. Assure no fibrosis progression. Again, regression. And then a targeted approach, as I've already said. Associated symptoms, it would be great if these therapies actually improve side effects. So why not lump it into if we are picking the best of? This is our roadmap, and again, we'll walk through this. Again, uh, you have seen pieces of it, but this is, in my mind, how I understand immune activation and what the problem is with AIH. So there is a foreign piece that comes into your body, whether it's foreign or actually yourself, and this could be a protein, it could be a virus, it could be just a piece of something 
that what's called an antigen positioning cell actually takes in and displays to a lymphocyte. You can see here the lymphocytes are interacting two different types, CD8 cells, which are called cytotoxic T cells, and then helper T cells, CD4 cells, interact with that antigen from that antigen presenting cell. One piece that is then uh, basically reacts to this is something called the adaptive immunity. Your body forms antibodies. These are from B cells. B cells actually historically, in the, before five years ago, we thought B cells probably had little importance in AIH. We think more so now that this actually may be a really important therapeutic target. But honestly, it's a really a constellation of B cell activation as well as CD8 and CD4 cells that actually result in targeting the liver for a wet mechanism, unknown, but a combination of antibodies, but also antigen-activated lymphocytes to really result in liver cell destruction. The problem is when you have this destruction, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy of continued release of pieces of cells would actually then create a local microenvironment of activation, increased cytokines, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and it basically snowballs is what we think. And you can see here it just is a cyclic type of piece until we actually intervene. One piece of this, and I will hone you into the piece of that roadmap I just showed you of looking at a target. So when this antigen presenting cell speaks with one of these lymphocytes, it actually speaks with something called a, a T cell receptor. This T cell receptor is really important, but it is actually worthless without a molecule called CD3. CD3 can actually, in turn, convey the signal from the antigen presenting cell to this lymphocyte and cause it to be activated, which in our case, in AIH's case, is not a good thing. One approach is to consider a molecule called anti-CD3, or also known as OKT3. This has been around for years, used in a post-transplant setting. It actually is an effective inhibitor of CD3, and this would be a possible target in the future. Um, however, there's some significant problems because there are side effects, and again, immune suppression, too much suppression, bone marrow suppression uh, could be correlated with this, much like any of the agents that we'll talk about. We actually have some data, though, from a mouse model. Again, we have no human data on this unless it just happened to be used in a patient with AIH. And really, the important thing here is to show that in a type 2 model, so type 2 autoimmune hepatitis model of mice, after, when you give therapy between 7 and 8 months, this is AIH in a control, there's no change. However, you do it in the, someone giving a molecule. We see a reduction in AST, or AST and ALT. We also see a reduction from the histologic activity in AIH with the use of anti-CD3 as well. And again, if we learned anything from our lectures, we see the kind of darker is bad. These are inflammatory cells in what's called a classic interface hepatitis. With treatment, we see resolution of symptoms. This is mouse models. We we'll also show a few of these others in mouse models as well. Now this is another interesting thing, same activation step. However, there's another important molecule. There's a molecule called CD80 slash 86, so two different times, but CD28. And actually this is another way, another way uh, that the T cells can actually downregulate the antigen positioning cell, basically telling it to shut up, meaning that it's being too active. So there may be a problem, and I'm gonna show you a really interesting case study of a girl that has a problem with this. But ultimately there's a drug on the market right now that actually can interact at this CD80 slash 86, and it competitively blocks out the CD28 from a, maybe a dysfunctional T cell. It's called a batacept, and actually used in rheumatologic uh, diseases, particularly RA. Um, but basically, again, it's a negative feedback system. It's telling the antigen positioning cell to stop and allowing this T cell to kind of just kind of level out. This case report was published, I think it was this past year, and this is a 14-year-old girl uh, from Korea that actually presented very early in life with some problems. You can see chronic diarrhea by age one, found that she had an autoimmune enteropathy, meaning that there was autoimmune destruction of the lining of her GI tract. Also then a pernicious anemia, so that is a destruction of parietal cells in the stomach. Um, finally, to cap it all off, autoimmune hepatitis by she was nine years old. In Korea, maybe some things can get done we can't do here, but genome-wide uh, testing, we found that she had a really a dysfunctional piece of this, which is CTLA, which is actually what binds here, and that's the CD CD28 molecule. So essentially what we're able to do is give a batacept, and unfor or unfortunately for her, we actually saw restoration of all of her T cell function and, and deregulation, or actually regulation of this overactive immune system, improving all of these pieces. So this just harps on the idea that there's a possibility that autoimmune hepatitis 
may be driven by specific mutations at a lot of different steps that we could theoretically target. Toll-like receptor four. This is important and has been talked about doc by Dr. Mackay earlier. Um, he talked about naloxone. Um, this is maybe a possible mechanism of that. Narcan is always on the social media networks as a possible way to consider treatment for autoimmune hepatitis. And really, toll-like receptor four, if you want to think of it, it's kind of a modifier um, of the overall immune activity. And if you stimulate toll-like receptor four, you actually get upregulation. And he talked about this too. It's called NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is really a gene that upregulates a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and molecules that really provide forward progression of an overzealous immune system. And again, you get overall C, uh, T cell proliferation, survival, and again, that secretion of pro-inflammatory molecules. And again, purely amplifying. So what do we have in terms of toll-like receptor 4? Um, one thing is to consider toll-like receptor 4, that there are other ways of actually engaging it. And we see this with a number of different ways of injury. So this may provide a lucrative way to look at uh, overzealous immune inflammation in a number of different diseases, including uh, NASH, NAFLD, but also autoimmune hepatitis. So we actually see inhibition, um, and this is what's called JKB-122, provided by, doc, or by Taiwan J, who is uh, a proud sponsor of this meeting. And then, in fact, we see in their mouse model actually quite a nice response. Ultimately, all we need to pay attention to is the, the, the vehicle, which is the control, but then also the dose arms, where we see we give 5 and 10 milligrams equivalent, and we see a, D, a sharp demarcation and drop of AST or an ALT. We also see then with vehicle, which is control, compared inflammation to the 5 to the 10, actually it's 20 and 50 per kilogram, marked uh, lowering of any immune activity. So again, this is a thought that it could be a possible therapy in the future, and there currently is a trial using this compound for hard-to-treat AIH patients. Other presenters have also talked about this idea of Tregs or T-regulatory cells, and I don't know if it's been framed extremely well, but one piece that the Tregs do, remember the CD4s and the CD8 cells? Basically, the, the CD4 Treg cells basically tell them to shut up. They say, slow down. And in, and in fact, we have actually have studies now in autoimmune hepatitis that these may be deficient in AH patients, but they also may not work correctly to actually slow down the immune system. These are all primed in the thymus, and, and again, this kind of downregulation role has made a kind of a, an idea that we could actually take Tregs from individuals, farm them, expand them, and give them back to patients as a way to immune modulate basically with their own immune cells, but by giving it back. Now, if you really believe Tregs don't work well in autoimmune hepatitis, it may not work well in that model. But it definitely is an interesting approach and actually is really beyond the mouse model, I think, starting for clinical trials hopefully soon. Rituximab, it's, uh, it's been used for autoimmune hepatitis. There is actually some case series as well. I told you B cells historically was not thought to be a dramatic piece of AIH pathogenesis. And really what rituximab does is it hits a receptor on the B cells called CD20. And ultimately what we see is by giving rituximab and, and a number of different protocols that have been published now, we actually can see substantial improvement in uh, inflammation and remission. Um, it's a very potent immunosuppressant. It works at the B cell. And essentially it's like hitting the reset on B cells, if you want to think of it that way. This data is a little extensive, but this, I just want to show you a picture of the six patients from the study in 2013, and one of the first that came out. And you can take a look at how patients look. A number of males and females, um, a lot of patients that were intolerant, but also refractory. Again, these are the patients that are hard to treat. And this is not a great crisp picture, but ultimately, if you follow on the left side, Patients starting with high IgG on the right side, starting with high ALT, over the 72 weeks of the trial, we see a sharp demarcation of drop um, with rituximab. So this is also potentially a viable therapy and strategy in hard-to-treat patients. And so I get a lot of questions about evolving therapy. I probably get the most about this. This is pre-implantation factor. And pre-implantation factor... It's been around for a while and actually used by a pharmaceutical company. It was, it was purchased and really studied in OBGYN more than anything before it started to be thought of in autoimmunity. And really when baby is formed as a fetus, the, the embryo travels to mom's uterus, which actually, you know, the embryo has different DNA compared to mom. So in fact, it theoretically should trigger an immune response. It is foreign. 
the placenta formation in this, in this embryo can actually feed back to mom's immune system by secretion of pre-implantation factor and modulate mom's immune response. So we want to harness that power then to bring it to more of the clinical spectrum in AIH. And so we actually have had a phase one trial, and phase two is undergoing right now. Ultimately, we have seen a, a significant reduction. You can be the judge of how significant. But of all the patients that have been involved in it, we see a mean drop in ALT from an average of 91 down to 68. And again, these are hard to treat patients. Um, we see a sharp demarcate or a sharp drop too with after just a single dose. So I think this is interesting. I think this will probably spread to other centers um, as more interest is, 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 is gained from it. The idea again is it's innocuous. However, I'll warn you, again, nothing is completely innocuous. We talked about a number of mechanisms or potential therapies, um, but things to kind of just br briefly speak about, probiotics. We have identified some bacteria, at least from two studies, that can modulate inflammation specifically in AIH. Could this be a strategy in the future? Could antimicrobials be a strategy in the future? Furthermore, in PSC research, molecules that have been important in potentially fibrosis progression and therape therapeutic agents used there, could that be an approach? And anti lox l 2 is another kind of a piece that may be interested in using in AIH in preventing fibrosis uh, progression. Finally, too, if you look on clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see mindfulness. We've talked a little bit about this with Dr. Mackay this morning. I think this is interesting, thinking about the stress and how this possibly modulates the immune system and also the potential for flare. Also, dietary sodium recently has been, there was a New England Journal paper two years ago that high sodium diet may have some role in autoimmune activation. We actually looked at this with uh, online social media and we didn't see a difference and this was all patient reported data. However, most patients are high sodium in our society, unfortunately. So in conclusions, the paradigm of AIH to take away is, is really, uh, let's, let's individualize care and that is really our goal. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is to further understand pathogenesis. So what causes it? What is the perfect medication? Well, it stops inflammation. It reverses fibrosis, it has no side effects, and it improves associated symptoms. And maybe if we're asking, we probably should be free too. <laughs> this is complex, there's no doubt about it. We all know this. But really, there are multiple targets. And these targets, really, we have drugs to use. And, and, and really, we should think about using these in hard to treat patients. However, this will take a lot of input from patients, doctors, but also insurance companies. So that is another major limitation as well. So thank you for your time.